Mm -hmm. Welcome to United with Christ. I'm Pastor Matthew Mitchell. I'm the pastor over at Park Hills Christian Church here in El Paso, Texas. Uh, you're about to join us for a five-week study on uh, one station of the tabernacle. Uh, it's called Tabernacle Studies, and we're going to be looking at the showbread, which represents the doctrine and teaching of the Bible. So the next five weeks, we're going to be looking at the Bible. I hope that you will join us. I, I encourage you to be a part of this, and I hope that you're encouraged to know more of how we got the Bible and how we read the Bible. I look forward to each week. Please come and join us. United with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors serving throughout the Border Valley community and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation of Life Christian Broadcasting Television. And now... United with Christ. Welcome to United with Christ. I'm Pastor Matthew Mitchell with Park Hills Christian Church here in El Paso, Texas. I'm really excited. The next five Wednesdays, we'll be looking at a part of a study. Uh, this study is based off the tabernacle. I find that the tabernacle was more than just a place where the Jews would go to worship and, and sacrifice to God. The tabernacle was a place that actually had significant teaching. Each station in the tabernacle had a specific uh, meaning, and it was to help people know more about who God is. You know, A.W. Tozer said, the greatest thing you know about God is the greatest thing you know about yourself. And so the more we know about God, the more we know about ourselves. And so the tabernacle was just another picture or introduction to who God is. I find that when we come to the tabernacle, you entered a, a one gate that represented one way to God. And the first station you came to in the tabernacle was the altar of sacrifice. This is where the priest would, would offer up the sacrifices for the sins of the people uh, to appease God so that he would not destroy them because of their sin. Next, we would move to the laver. The laver was the second station in the tabernacle, and it represents sanctification, a process of being made pure. Uh, the priests would go and purify themselves every time uh, before and after they would offer up sacrifices for the people. And next, you would move into the first part of the tent, and you would see three stations there. One would be the showbread, the candlesticks, and the uh, incense. Now, the candlesticks were a representation of Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world. Uh, the showbread represents the, the actual word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but, but every word of God. And then the incense is, would represent the Holy Spirit in worship. And then from there, you'd move into the Holy of Holies, the final station of the tabernacle. And, and that always represented where God dwelled. Each one of these stations has a significant meaning uh, of understanding of, of God. Uh, for the next five weeks, we're going to be looking at the showbread, the Word of God. And today's uh, study is, uh, is called, What is the Bible? I'd like to share with you how we got the Bible and where it comes from and a little bit of information that you may not know. So I hope you're encouraged and uh, that you find a little bit of something that you may not have known that would help you share more why people should read the Bible. So I want to start off is, what is the Bible? Uh, you know, the Bible is, it's this right here what I'm holding in my hand. You know, we have it in different versions. We have, uh, I happen to read the, in a, in the New American Standard, but you may read the King James, the New King James, the NIV, uh, the Amplified. Uh, you may even read the ESV. All these Bibles are wonderful books of, of God's Word, and they are God's Word to His creation. Now, the Bible is not necessarily written to you and I specifically. Uh, when you come to the book of Romans, the book of Romans was written to the church of Rome. Uh, and at that time, there were specific people in a specific culture in a specific time. And to understand that, we would read it, uh, what the author's intent to the original reader. And from there, we would get what God has intended for us to learn about ourselves. Uh, but this Bible is, is made up of 66 books. 
Uh, each book uh, is written by different authors. Um, some of them have the same author, but there, there's about, I believe, 40 different authors that have written this Bible. Uh, some of them were kings, prophets, leaders, uh, followers of Jesus. Uh, this Bible is, was written over 1,500 years. From Genesis to Revelation, uh, the Bible is, expands a, a, a time period of 1,500 years. So a lot of time and effort went into uh, putting this book together. It is divided into two different sections. We have the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is, is everything that happened from beginning of time up to uh, the cross. And then the New Testament takes up from the cross all the way to the end of time. And so here we have a complete uh, synopsis or, or work of God that goes from the beginning to the end. Uh, the New Testament is, uh, is separated from the Old Testament about 400 years where God has been, was silent with the people of, uh, of Israel. And then Jesus comes on the, uh, on the scene and God starts to speak to the people once again. Uh, it was written in Koine, Koine Greek, uh, where the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and Aramaic, and it's a combination of those. Uh, the canonicity of the Bible, how uh, I've gotten many questions of why do we have uh, these Bible, these books uh, in the Bible? How did we come about uh, choosing these ones? Because there was a lot of writings out there. Why these ones? Well, Number one, the, the, they were chosen because uh, they speak about God's authority. Every book in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation speaks about God's authority. God is all authoritative over all things. Uh, he spoke and things came into being, so therefore he, was, uh, he has authority over all things. In fact, the New Testament tells us that when Jesus Christ uh, uh, goes back to heaven, the Father puts all things under His feet, under His authority. And so the Father gives the authority to Jesus to oversee all of creation. Um, it was written by spiritual leaders of Israel, like I said, prophets, kings, and scribes. Uh, so these books had to be written by people who were acknowledged by the Jews uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, they had to be acknowledged that they were written by apostles of Jesus Christ or, or, um, or someone close enough to the apostles that they could be verified as, as truth. Uh, we have the four Gospels. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, Matthew was one of the original 12 disciples. Um, Mark was actually John Mark that we read in the New Testament with Paul and Silas. Uh, John Mark uh, is, writ is written, uh, a, it's Peter's account of, of, of the gospel. And then we have Luke. Luke was a Gentile. Luke was not a, a Jew or was not even part of the Twelve, but Luke walked so closely to uh, Paul and other apostles that, uh, in fact, uh, Luke was, in my opinion, the first apologist because Luke says, uh, my dear Theophilus, I write these things to you so that you may know what you believe and know that it, it is true. So Luke was putting an account of the gospel together and the book of Acts so that this man Theophilus could know that what he believes to be truth. And uh, it was verified. And many of the apostles and uh, early church people who were there with Jesus were still alive when Luke wrote this. So if Luke had written something that not to be true, it would have been discredited and, 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 not, and not accepted by the early church. Uh, but then you have uh, John, who was an apostle of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, the rest of the Bible is, written by, uh, is mostly written by uh, Paul. Uh, as you uh, the letters to the churches, but then you have uh, James, the brother of Jesus Christ, who was one of the uh, lead elders of the church in Jerusalem. Uh, you have um, Peter, who was an apostle. You have John again, who was an apostle, who wrote these things. And so you have a lot of different writers through through the New Testament and the Old Testament, but they were significant people who knew who were knew, who were known to be. Um, true in what they said. Uh, many would say if this wasn't true, it would have been thrown out. And so there was verifiable proof, and these, these were all accepted. Uh, 
It also contains the faith set by the apostles of Jesus Christ. And so as Jesus Christ taught his apostles, uh, what we see is we see that they, uh, they set um, uh, the faith. Uh, they set the, the parameters of what uh, the ch early church believed. They also uh, were written, uh, were uh, universal, accepted, and authoritative by the church. So these were the books that the early church accepted as authoritative, that these were God's word. Okay? Uh, and also, it was writing, um, writings that go along with the early church and always taught and practiced. So these were books that the early church was known to use in their teaching time. It also contains the revelation of truth. It is God's revelation of truth. Uh, God says, I am truth. Uh, not that he tells the truth, but God is truth, meaning God, his whole being is truth. And the books of the Bible are his truth uh, because they point to him. Uh, you will see throughout from Genesis to Revelation, it points to the power of God and Jesus Christ. Uh, Dr. Wilkie from Dallas Theological Seminary, uh, he's passed now, but he used to teach a course, The Gospel According to the Old Testament, in his Old Testament survey class. And he would point out from Genesis to Malachi how it points to Jesus Christ and the cross. And so the whole Bible is all about God, who he is, and what he's done for you and I. Uh, this Bible can be accepted as truth. Um, because if one error had been in it, uh, it would have been uh, cast out. There were very uh, strict rules based on how, we, how this was written. In fact, every time the name of God was written, the quill that would write the words had to be burned and a new quill had to be um, reused. If uh, a scribe had been writing, uh, let's say, uh, the book of Psalms and gets to the last verse the last chapter, the last word of the whole book of Psalms and made an error. The whole book from that point on was, was burned and the scribe would start over from the beginning. Can you imagine the frustration that would have been if you get there and you write, you write something that's, and you copied it wrong because you were tired and didn't see it correctly? The whole thing was burned. So there were very strict rules on when these things were written and how they were um, kept to be pure. They didn't have the printing press, and uh, and so therefore, uh, a lot of times, the, you know, it was handwritten from a copy. Um, the reason for uh, uh, let's go back real quick. Uh, the number of manuscripts. So we don't have the original. Uh, we don't have the original letter to the, Ro the Church of Rome or the original letter to the Church of Ephesus or the original gospel that Matthew, Mark, or Luke, John, and John wrote. We have copies. Now, the Bible, the copies that have been discovered are 5,600 copies of the, of, of the books of the Bible. So we have more than enough copies of each book uh, to show that we have the truth because there are very little er uh, disagreements in the copies. It might be a comma or it might be uh, a, a, a punctuation or something like that. Nothing that would really change the meaning or the, uh, the writings. And so uh, we have, we've had over 5,600 copies that verify each copy in itself. Um, the other closest writing in man's history was Homer's Iliad. Homer uh, wrote the, the Iliad, which we get the story of uh, the Trojan War and the Trojan Horse and, and stories of Odysseus and, and others. Homer's Iliad, uh, we've only been able to find 643 copies. So we don't have the original of Homer's Iliad, but we do have 643 copies of it. And no one ever questions whether these copies were um, right or wrong. In fact, these copies actually have more errors, uh, copy errors than, than the 5,600 that the Bible have. And so nobody questions that. But 
For many centuries and many years, people have tried to discredit this. Uh, they tried to get rid of it. They have tried to burn it. They've tried to um, ignore it. Uh, they've tried to destroy it. But it keeps hitting the shelves. In fact, the Bible is the top, has been the top number one selling book of all time. People still look for it. In fact, those who, uh, there are non-believers who will look through its pages to try to find some kind of secret to life. There is a secret. And it is the one thing that this Bible refers to from the beginning to end, and that is Jesus Christ. He is the one who changes. He is the, he is the author and perfecter of faith. He is the one who grants us forgiveness and helps to change our lives. You want the best self-help book? Go purchase one of these. Uh, this is the best self-help book that you'll ever find because in its pages you will find truth and you will find Jesus Christ who will help change you into the person that you were created to be. Also, um, the reason why uh, this Bible, these books were canonized and put together and were accepted uh, is one, it needed to, uh, the church needed to stop false doctrine. Uh, the Gnostics were those who, uh, at the time, in much of the New Testament, you, you can find that the refer, uh, referring to the Gnostics, the Gnostics were truth seekers. They believed that you could find truth in, in knowledge. And so that they would read everything they possibly could. They would seek knowledge. And they even read the Bible and, and used its knowledge in their, in their religious system because they thought they found truth and they found knowledge in it. And, but they missed the biggest piece, and that was Jesus. Because the Bible is very clear. Uh, there is no one but Jesus that can save. And so, but they would find salvation through knowledge. And so the, the, the early church had to put together a group of books that, um, that would help the early church and the Christians know what they believe and why they believed it, that they would know who Jesus was and more about God and, uh, so that they could continue to live a life for God. And so the Gnostics granted, uh, brought in a... Um, some false teaching because they were bringing teachings from other faiths and other, and other things and other practices and philosophies. And so the church put together these books so we know what we believe and why we believe it. Um, the, uh, also, it was to stop false writings. Uh, some desired to write about Jesus' childhood. Uh, Jesus, uh, they, some tried to write that Jesus was married. Uh, to Mary Magdalene, there were writings that shed light on uh, personality, other personalities in the New Testament. Uh, I want you to know that these books that we have, you can know that these are true. Um, that there are no other books that you need to to read from. Uh, most of the books that were out there, the false writings, um, were were prove, uh, proven to be false. They were written way after, hundreds of years after uh, the canonization of the Bible or the teachings of Jesus. And the early church didn't need to any other writings than what they canonized right here. In fact, these were put together to shed light on the falsehood of those things. Uh, it was to preserve the authority of the book. Uh, A.D. 303, the persecution of the church starts. Christian's writings were trying to be destroyed, and so they, they put these together to preserve the authenticity and the truth of God's Word. The Bible is also inerrant, meaning that it's without flaw or without error. Uh, it extends, it, it talks about science, it talks about history and archaeology, and also spiritual things. Though the Bible is not a science book, it's not a history book, it's not an archaeological book, um, when it speaks about these things, it is always true to those things. One of my favorites uh, story is that uh, many archaeologists try to disprove the Bible because uh, it refers to um, the city of uh, Tyre. Uh, and archaeology had never discovered the city of Tyre at, at, at this point. 
and there was an archaeologist that was in went to where the Bible had said the city of Tyre was, and he was tr- excavating and, and going around trying to find the city of Tyre. And then as he was sitting on the banks, he looked over, and he sees this peninsula where, where fishermen were uh, drying their nets after a day of fishing. And he walks over there and he starts to excavate some of this peninsula because it looked it didn't look natural. And as he's excavating, he started to find pottery. And he started to find remnants of a city. And what he discovered was the city of Tyre. See, what had happened in the days of, uh, of uh, uh, Alexander the Great, he was going around the world conquering and he came to the city of Tyre to conquer it. But the problem was the city of Tyre had two cities, one on the bank and an island that was just off the city. And when uh, um, enemies would come to conquer them, they would pack up and they would go to the island and they would be able to wait out their, uh, their enemies. The enemies would run out of food and get tired of, of not being able to get to, the, to the, um, the island because you needed boats and they would come by land. So when this happened with Alexander the Great, he got so angry and so frustrated that he started destroying the city of Tyre that was on the bank and had his men throw the rubble into the water. And they created themselves a peninsula to the island. And when they got to the island, they sacked the city of Tyre and destroyed it. And they destroyed it, not just took captive of it, they destroyed it. They burned it to the ground and and they, they made it into rubble so that there would be no traces of the city of Tyre until this archaeologist archaeologist, uh, discovered the remnants of the city of Tyre, thus proving the Bible to be true when it speaks about archaeological finds or archaeology. Uh, Proverbs 30, verse 5 tells us this, Every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. We believe in the Latin words sola scriptura, meaning scripture alone. We don't need extra uh, biblical writings. We just need this to know who God is. When the Bible speaks, we know it to be true. When the Bible teaches, we can learn from it. And we only need scripture alone. We don't need man's commentary on scripture to understand it. Uh, God's word is given to us to understand. The Holy Spirit is given us to given to us to bring to life the words that are here. And this is all we need. Many um, religious groups will say, you can read the Bible, but you need to read our works to understand the Bible. Uh, for many years, uh, the Catholic Church uh, and sometimes they still do the masses in Latin. And the reason was at one point was to keep the people ignorant because they couldn't read. Uh, they, would, they were so dependent on the priest to give explanation to, to uh, what the word of God says. They couldn't read it for themselves. Until many years later when uh, someone came out and started making copies of the Bible and put it in the common language so people could understand. In fact, it was written in common language so everyone could understand uh, in Koine Greek. It is for the masses. It's not for a few leaders to say what is true and what is not. It is for you and I to read for ourselves and allow God to speak to us and teach us. Now, like I said, it wasn't written specifically to me. But the principles here in the Bible are for me. And we'll be looking at how to discover those this week as we continue. Uh, but it is not a, it's not a letter to me. But within its pages contains the principles of God that are for me. Um, it's not a rule book. It's not a do this and don't do that. It's a principle book. Principles by which I can live. Principles by which I can live the best life that I have, that I can have. See, God is not trying to keep something from you. God wants you to live the best life you can. And the reason why in these pages he says don't do something is because he knows that it's not the best for you. Uh, He's not trying to keep something from you. But he wants you to understand 
the principles on how to live the best life you can. Sola Scriptura. Scripture alone is all we need to find truth, to find healing, to find purpose, to find the life that God intended for you and I to live. It contains the principles for life, the principles to live a full life in Him. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Since we have such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every sin and encumbrance that so easily entangles us. And let us run this race with endurance that's set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of the faith. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. These words are the re will renew your mind. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Folks, these are all words, all words that teach us about God and His, His greatness. They teach us about who God is and His purpose for us, His principles and how we can live for Him, His teachings, His map to guide us in life is right here, the best-selling book of all time. It's amazing what this book will do for your life. If we would only dust it off the shelf and read it a little bit more. If we would get off our phones and, and open up its pages and, and, and read, you can find the truth for what you're seeking because what you're seeking is truth. I want to thank you so much uh, for participating today and being with us as we look at what the Bible is. I hope you'll join us this week uh, as we look at how to read the Bible, and we'll have fun on the last day about the errors of the Bible. Please uh, call the prayer line for help. I'm Pastor Matthew Mitchell, and I thank you so much for joining today, and may God be with you.